Yes, a bit. No, not at all. Yes, it's coming. So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I would like to first to thank uh, ISIS and Professor Trudy Bray, chairperson of the organizing committee, for having included uh, this year again two key events with the CSH in this uh, annual conference on uh, economic growth and development. First, uh, yesterday there was a gala dinner, and I hope everybody enjoy it within reason, of course. And second, the special uh, high size CSH panel discussion, and I hope everybody will enjoy it today again without any restriction. Special thanks go to Professor Shetan Gate from the planning unit too, since he put a lot of efforts to get together such an interesting and distinguished panel on this key but complex uh, topic inequality in India. And many thanks go also, and of course, to the panelists themselves for having accepted to join and share with, with us their view. Uh, I'm sure we'll learn uh, a lot from you, from you during the next uh, one and a half uh, hours. I have myself the great honor today to chair this outstanding panel of well-known economists, Professor Koshu, uh, Koshik Basu sorry, of Cornell University and before from DSE. You are currently Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank. You hold or have held many other posts with the Reserve Bank of India, the ILO, the Human Development and Capability Association funded by Amartya Sen, etc. You have held visiting position uh, at the Institute uh, for uh, Advanced Study at Princeton, the London School of Economics, the Harvard the University, the MIT, and so on. You are editor of Social Choice and Welfare and served or served uh, one of the, uh, on the editor board of the Journal of Economic Perspectives, the Journal of Development Economics, the World Bank Economic Review, and the Japani Japanese Economic Review. You have published widely in the area of development economics, industrial organization, game theory, and welfare economics. And in May 2008, you were awarded one of the Indian highest civilian awards, the Patma Bhushan, by the President of India. <coughs> I'll stop here. <laughs> No, go on, go on. <laughs> 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 Professor Debra Dre. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> also based in the US, uh, you are Silver Professor and Professor of Economics at the uni New York University. You are co editor of the American Economic Review and research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. Your research interests uh, and publication are focused on microeconomic theory, game theory, and development economics. You have a wide uh, teaching experience at Stanford, ISI, Boston University, Harvard, and of course, uh, New York University. Some months ago, instead myself of reading from, uh, from A to Z the book of Thomas Piketty, uh, who pushed the French economist in the spotlight just a few months before Jean Tirole, I focused on various comments and critiques written on capital in the 21st century, and I found some your paper entitled Mid Piketty as one of the most <laughs> stimulating ones. I know you will say uh, today a few words to explain why you think the third fundamental analysis of Piketty is wrong on different grounds. And if time may lack today to discuss this issue in detail, we may try to invite, in fact, Thomas Piketty next year in Delhi, in 2015, <laughs> to present his bestseller and discuss this issue and some other with you and some other colleague from India. Dr. Ratin Roy, you are now based in India, uh, but you worked uh, in over 80 countries and you are a well-known figure in the world of applied ec macroeconomics and fiscal policy. This mic, uh, yeah. Uh, after your PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK, you were economist, economist at the SOAS in London and uh, at the Institute for Development Policy and Management in Manchester before being director of two UN UNDP centers, the Asia-Pacific Regional Center in Bangkok and the F International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth in Brazil. Last year, in May, you took charge as director of the NIPFP, the National Institute for of Public Finance and Policy. On invitation from the government of India, you also served as the economic advisor of, uh, to the 13th Finance Commission, and you have been appointed this year as part-time member of the 7th Central Pay Commission. 
Last but not least, Iman Xu. You are professor of economics at GNU, but also visiting researcher, research fellow at CSH and associate fellow at the London School of Economics. Your areas of research include issues related to poverty, inequality, employment, food security, and agrarian change. You have been involved with various government committees, including the expert group of measurement of uh, uh, poverty, better known as the uh, Tandoukla Committee. Some years ago, you have received the Sanjay uh, Takur Young Economist Award of the Indian Society of Labor Economics, and have been nominated Personalité d'Avenir by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs at CSH in our Department Economics and Development, where inclusive growth drives all our research activity from long-term agrarian transition to measurement or public policy issue. Uh, you handle two our two uh, biggest current projects, one, the sixth round of survey since 1958 of, the, of a small village in North UP, Palanpur, along with the London School of Economics and Professor Nicolas Stern, and two, the multidisciplinary research project NOPOR, a EU-funded project for enhancing knowledge for renewed policy against poverty, a project which involves more than 100 scientists from all over the world in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Let us enter now in the heart uh, of, the, of the matter, inequality in India. After a brief introduction from myself, not more than four minutes, you will have, you will have the panelists 15 minutes each to present your points in the following order. So Imanchu, 15 minutes, Debraj, 15 minutes, Kaushik, 15 minutes, and Ratin, 15 minutes. Uh, after this round, you will be granted each uh, five minutes more maximum to question or respond to each other. With uh, we expect either uh, a hot debate on a specific issue or a clear consensual roadmap about inequality in India, no space between. <laughs> after this round table, 15 uh, after this round table, 15 minutes uh, should remain for an open discussion with the room. And I will be very grateful, Professor Koshik Basu, if you could kindly chair this last part of the panel discussion and conclude uh, it with few few words. During the open discussion, please do not forget to m introduce yourself and to mention to whom you are asking a question. Let me now, uh, if it works, I know the PowerPoint has disappeared. Yes, it Why works. Not? Thank you. So let me now introduce to you very briefly and in my way this panel dis discussion on equality, inequality in India. Um, we show that the, uh, we know, sorry, that the number of extreme poor people has, has declined worldwide, but the figure is still very high. In 2010, 1.2 billion people were below 1.25 uh, 1 uh, US dollar per day on PPP basis which represented about one-fifth of the world population. We also know that extreme poverty is still largely concentrated in rural areas of developing countries where much of the labor force is in agriculture. In India, the percentage is 80% in 2012, according to, uh, I think, the latest uh, RBI estimates. Uh, in agriculture, we also know that the average value added per worker is lower than in the non-agricultural sector, and that this gap is larger in poor, poor country. Goleaks, Go Golins and colleagues have just published a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics <laughs> where they challenge the national account data with new micro evidence, but they find that even after considering sector evidence differences sorry, in, our, in how 
worked and human capital per worker, per worker as well as alternative measures of sector output constructed, constructed from household survey data. So they conclude a puzzling large gap, gap remain. As far as I'm concerned, I'm more interested to study the long-term dynamics rather than the exact figure at the point of time, point of time if it, even if it's important. And I found that this gap narrow, narrowed quickly in rich countries in the 60s until arriving in what Peter Timmer called a world without agriculture, where the share of agriculture in both total labor and value added is 3%, and where, this is also important, the average farm and non-farm labor productivity have converged. So there is no gap, but also very few farmers remaining in the countryside. On the polar uh, opposite uh, of this uh, rich country, sorry, uh, on the polar opposite of this rich country dynamics, in most Asian developing countries, including India and China, the gap, the, the agricultural productivity gap, has widened, as also the workforce in agriculture, while their GDP growth rate was higher than elsewhere in the world. Last but not least, we also know that inequality has been growing steadily through the later part of the 20th century, with the reemergence of extreme rich people in rich country, but also, and more recently, in an emerging country like India, where we have today about two lakhs millionaires and, top, and two top ten world billionaires in US dollars. So I do not have time uh, here, I uh, show you a graph, but I do not have time to present and comment this graph illustrating the polar dynamics I mentioned a few seconds ago between OECD country on top right and Asian country on uh, bottom left but it is available on internet for those who are interested. Now, uh, I, qu I quickly shift now to a more optimistic picture. We have reason to hope, at least theoretically. I will here mention just uh, four points widely accepted in mainstream economics. First, within country, the agricultural productivity gap rise rises at first with economic growth, but then falls at ad as additional growth distributes pro prosperity more widely. We have, in fact, observed a Kuznet inverted U curve in the history of the now rich OECD country, and it seems that there is no reason that such phenomenon reoccur elsewhere in the future, as Macmillan and Roddick suggested on the graph shown on the slide. As far as, uh, as the convergence between rich and poor countries is concerned, the neoclassical growth theory states rather clearly that countries with access to identical technology should converge to a common income level. Countries that are poorer and have higher marginal productivity of capital should grow more rapidly in the transition to the long-run steady states. And last, open global economy, access to foreign capital and foreign market should strengthen the convergence. So this point, and especially uh, the second one on identical technology, brings me to the question I wanted myself after all of this to ask to our panelists. In a country like India, do we really believe that the migration of labor out of agriculture will be so large in the future that the remaining Indian farmer will sooner or later increase their labor productivity by enlarging their farm size and mechanize them as in OECD country. Can a country like India really mimic sooner or later the historical division pattern of modern growth of OECD country until arriving into a world without agriculture where labor productivity have converged? My personal answer is no for some reason I cannot detail here, but that lead me to think that India may be today in the forefront for inventing another pattern of growth and structural transformation where agriculture should not only provide, it, should not only provide cheap and nutritional, nutritious food, but also services, especially ecological services of local and global importance, services of course that should be paid to the provider as uh, in the service sector. Thank you for your attention. I will, I will ask to Imanchu to present uh, this can slide. I, can I from there?
Thanks, Bruno. Uh, thanks, Chetan, for, the, for giving us the brief as to how to go about it. Uh, given that we have only 15 minutes to begin, then we can come back in our five minutes. Let me quickly go ahead with uh, what I intend to present, which is basically give you a rough, uh, rough idea of what has happened to inequality in India particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. And the way uh, to go about it is uh, not just looking at only the consumption inequality, which is something which uh, more or less everybody, at least in this room, would be aware of, but to go into some different dimensions of inequality as to how does inequality play up in uh, different ways. Uh, I mean, uh, this is something which is well known. I mean, this is about just simply the growth rate and that we are now on a different trajectory. At least the last two, three years, the growth rate of the economy has started slowing down. And that has raised certain concerns. But as far as the period where the growth actually picked up in the sense, particularly the last decade, and so ever since 2004 5, when we went into a high growth trajectory, the inequality is something which has uh, kept on increasing, something which has been increasing not just from last 2004 5 onwards, but ever since 1991. We have data, and this is from the consumption data that is coming from the National Sample Survey data. And these are the consumption inequalities, which basically are also showing increasing but uh, flattening out in the last two years, 2009-10 to 11-12, which is the last data, that data point that we have. But interesting is also the fact that this is a consumption inequality, which many people tend to believe that is, India is a low inequality country. But that is not factually correct, simply because we don't measure income, we don't compare it with income inequality, which is generally measured in other countries. But we do have some data on income inequality. And if you look at the income inequality data, which we have from the IHDS data, the last one that is there for 2005, the next one should be out uh, maybe uh, next year. But what we get from the inequ income inequality data, then our income inequality data in 2005 is 0.5 to the Gini, which puts us in a comparable league of high income inequality countries. So we are not so less uh, income uh, inequality country, but if you measure it, and incidentally, this number of 0.52 that you see has remained unchanged from the last time that we had the income inequality figure. That was in the 1970s. Again, the NCAR did the income survey. And it hasn't seen much change from that time to up to 2005 when we had the income inequality data. But I think these are the broad numbers, and these are something which uh, most of us are aware of. What we do need to also figure out is to break it down. And so as we have talked about the national inequality numbers from the consumption or income, whichever you take it, these are again something which are, and, and if, I love using this graph, and this is basically taken from Montex and Aluwalia's work in 2012, which is basically of interstate inequality, what is happening today. Look at the flat line in the 1980s. That was the time when we were again, we had the first acceleration in growth rate. We went to the 6% rate of growth. And it was the income inequality, at least, at least the, the uh, uh, interstate inequality in that sense remained flat. But it started rising after 1991, and it, ever since it has continued uh, after that, and this is up to 2008-9, but if you do it in any other way, make it uh, any other measure of inequality, of interest rate inequality, you'll find roughly the same picture. And this continues. This is, if you extend it to 2012-13, you'll find that this is something which is going on. This is not something which is showing a sound of going down. But I think more important is to go to the other forms of uh, inequalities that we're talking about. And I let me get back to national accounts, which very few people actually use it for inequality measurement. And the way I'm going to use it is to basically look at the factor incomes that are available from the national uh, accounts. And this basically gives you the idea of what is the distribution of factor incomes in the national accounts. And this is for 93, 94 starting and going up to 2011, 12. And these are the broad categories on which I'm going to show you. So these are agricultural wages, non-agricultural wages, and everything. Forget about all those. Look at the blue one, which is basically your uh, the uh, which, which which is uh, the what we will see that the greater one is where uh, the share of uh, self-employed in non-agriculture remains more or less the same. The 14 percent that you see is the agricultural share. The orange one is the share of uh, 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 private surplus, which is almost doubled 
from 93-94 to 2011-12, the private surplus or the private profit has gone up from 7% to 14.5%. But there has been a decline in the green one, which is the cultivation, and roughly mirrors the GDP of agriculture sector, which is close to now 13-14% 14, 14 by 2011-12. How do we do that? Well, now uh, we take it, look at what is the employment share, I mean, what is happening to employment. And this is some of the, something that is coming from the NSS employment and unemployment surveys. And what is the share of various groups in the employment share? And you don't see any increase in the private, organize, uh, private and public organized sector employment. It has remained fixed at where it was from 93, 94 onwards up to the 2011, 12. The broad share of the organized sector in the total employment has remained roughly fixed. And if you take it and make it into a per capita and then create a series as to what is happening to per capita incomes, what I've done is that taken 93, 94 as the base, 100. And then how does the incomes actually start moving? in terms of the national account and the employment and employment data. The last two that you see are the private salaries and the government salaries. The other ones are basically, uh, the green one is the cultivator's income, which is the self-employment in agriculture. The blue one, the, D, uh, the dark blue is the agricultural wages one. And you see the uh, government salaries and the private salaries. The, these are the two who start, which start diverging somewhere in the mid-1990s, and they continue to diverge. The kinks that you see in the government salaries are basically the impact of the pay commissions. So whenever there is a pay commission increase, then there is a certain <coughs> increase that happens. But basically, the private salaries and the government salaries, salaries have continued to grow faster than all other categories taken together. And remember, the share of these two, sal these two categories of organized employment is close to 5%, not more than that. So 95% is the remaining four graphs that we're talking about. What is it? Let's go to the other data set, which is the annual survey of industries. That data again gives you data on what is happening to managerial emoluments and what is happening to workers' wages. And if you look at it, this is the kind of a picture you get it. That the managerial emoluments are rising faster than the workers' wages. What is happening to profits out uh, as a share of net value added? And what is happening to the wages as a share of net value added? The wages as a share of net value added in the manufacturing sector were higher than the profits as a share of the net value added. Somewhere in the beginning of the 1990s, they cross each other. The share of the wages starts going down. It is now at the historical low of 10%, and it is staying at that 10% for the last seven to eight years. And look at what happens, the jump in terms of the profits as a, sec as a share of the net value added. It starts jumping somewhere around the beginning of the 2000s. And the 2008, when the financial crisis happens, it starts flattening out, and it remains at that level going down a little bit. But overall, the increase in the share of profits of the net value added in the manufacturing sector is a clear indication of what is happening to and where exactly who is gaining and who is not gaining out of it. You can get it from the national accounts also, because that's what, what I showed you from the ASI is basically for the manufacturing sector. But you can look at the entire organized sector together, and this is the kind of a picture that you get as to what is the distribution of factor shares as far as the organized sector total taken together is uh, from the uh, uh, national accounts. Not very surprising. This is something I think broadly, more or less, uh, uh, people are aware of. But then comes the surprise big picture that just at the time when the economy was turning out to be the highest, fastest growing economy, and we were saying that finally we broke out of it and the 6% rate of growth and we are moving into the 8% range of it, the employment generation collapsed. This is the total number of workers by usual status from the National Sample Survey. And it has remained roughly flat after 2004 or 5. A very, very small increase. And in fact, it's one of the lowest increase in employment generation for a long period of time. If you look at the recent history from 1972, 72, 73 onwards, this is the lowest rate of growth of employment. But this is not just that the employment was not created. This was something which has happened that the quality of employment also deteriorated. This again is coming up from the National Sample Survey data. You can look at it and then you find that this is something well known, 93% of the entire workers in India are in informal sector. They are informal employees. And that number hasn't changed in the last 10 to 10 year, more than 10 years. But what is surprising is what is happening to the organized sector, and particularly the private organized sector. Today, almost two thirds of the total workers in the organized private sector are informal sector workers. They are workers without any social security, without any kind of a benefit, without any kind of a uh, uh, pensions or leave or those kind of facilities. But even in the organized sector taken together, the number has grown from 1999-2000 to up to 2011-12. So the quality has gone down. And not all the change that you see in the employment changes that you're seeing, 
is something which can is simply because the economy. Uh, these are all uh, changes which are happening, uh, uh, driven by the what is happening to the growth structure. Part of that is also happening because of the way the labor market is functioning. And an interesting fact of that is that the most most of the decline in employment that you see is basically the decline in the female workforce participation. Not so much in the the male workforce has gone up. But what is interesting, and this is where uh, Bruno comes in, is the whole share of uh, agriculture. You have seen that between 2004, 5, 2011, 12, roughly 34 million workers left agriculture. And it has happened for the first time in the Indian history that workers, absolute number of workers in agriculture have come down. And you have a massive number of increase in workers in the non-agricultural sector. So the good news is that there is some kind of a non-farm diversification that is happening. But again, that diversification is very, very fast. And it is happening uh, uh, very rapidly after 2004, 5. But the quality, again, is something which is very worrying. Almost two-thirds of the total employment that was created in non-farm sector in the rural areas between 2004 to 2011 was actually casual employment. Most of that was also in <coughs> construction, which is low-quality, low-paying uh, job. And look at what is happening to the share of manufacturing, which is actually has come down in the rural areas. Manufacturing is not the one which is driving the non-farm. It is the construction and other services which are basically driving the employment generation in the non-farm sector. So people are moving from agriculture, which is good. And then come to the finally the organized sector back again, which is basically showing the share of contract workers, which I say defines as the people who don't have a fixed uh, regular em uh, employment in the manufacturing sector. The share just in 10 years has gone up from roughly around 20% to 34%, 35%. So it's almost going to the extent of doubling in the latest 10 years after 1999-2000 that we see the number of percentage of contract workers is, has gone up. But that's where the good news also comes in. But this is also the period when the poverty has reduced the fastest. In fact, one of the fastest reduction in poverty is also in the period after 2004-05. And it is something which is most likely people are willing to uh, give it uh, uh, the credit to the growth. I mean, this is also the period where growth has accelerated and probably that has led to the poverty reduction. Then why worry about inequality? Growth is accelerating, poverty is coming down. And even though inequality is increasing, why should one be worrying about inequality? But if you break it down as to why poverty is coming down and in what ways the inequality is playing up, then I think there are layers and layers of which which need to be unraveled as we progress. But just to give you some kind of an idea. In fact, remember, this is also a period when the food inflation has been stubbornly high. I mean, like RBI, everybody has been uh, bothered about it, how to bring it down, and it's finally now coming down with the fall of the international oil prices. But it was very, very stubborn. I mean, so much so that people, I mean, RBI has been branded as a stubborn, uh, whatever, to <laughs> not get into that. But this has also had, basically had an upshot, which basically meant that the people who were producing those commodities, the food commodities or the agricultural commodities, were also benefiting. Their incomes were increasing. So the agricultural incomes, particularly those who were producers, were in, they, they were benefiting out of it. But so was the case with the wages. I and mean, it is one, again one of, the, one, one of the, I mean, uh, uh, the fastest growth of real wages that we have seen in the recent history and now going at more than 6% uh, in, in real terms up to 2012-13. So I think a lot of things happen. Agriculture also uh, took a rebound. But finally, where do we come in? I mean, how do we reconcile these two factors? Probably what happened in the rural areas, probably what happened in terms of the agricultural sector, what happened to the wages, and what happened to the producers, did mean that the uh, benefits, a lot of benefits, did reach the people who were actually suffering from poverty and were stuck in poverty for a long period of time. Non-farm access was also something which is very, very important. But also what is important is the way the government finances work, which we now come to uh, blame in many ways. But the redistributive transfers which went to the poor people in terms of NREGA or PDS and others were equally responsible. And we had had uh, uh, now a lot of evidences which are coming from NREGA uh, on how it helped the poor, not just in incomes that went to the poor, but also in terms of other ways in uh, the poor were able to manage it. And in, so is the case with PDS where we have shown in our earlier work that it almost accounts for one third of the total poor poverty reduction. And if you're looking at the squared poverty gap and poverty gap, almost half of the total red poverty reduction after 2004 Four five is basically attributed to the transfers that are going to as part of the uh, public distribution system. But I think the issues that need to be uh, looked at is that something that is happening after 2004-5. And we need to unravel these. Some of these are now turning out to be uh, clear. But uh, before I end, now that the warning sign has been put up by Bruno, 
is that just to get back to you what is happening.